Hi everybody, Mike Hancock here and welcome very much to today's uh, webinar, getting to be one of the last in the year for us. We've got Dr. Kate Raines-Goldie uh, with us today from Perth in Western Australia, although that's not where she was born. Now, when I got to first know Kate, um, she really was a futurist and she was really in the way of disrupting the norm of society and business through what she always called uh, playfulness, fun, and things like you don't sort of see in most um, corporations. She's a multi-award winning designer. She's a researcher. She's a futurist. She's a columnist as well on innovation. And she's really curious about curiosity. She's worked <laughs> with some big players like the Commonwealth Bank of Australia, Deakin University, the Office of the Privacy Commissioner of Canada, the list goes on and on and on. And one of the things that uh, Kate's always been passionate about and she's worked very closely with is Lego and Lego Serious Play. And Kate, welcome today. It's lovely to have you on board with us today. And Thank you so much. I think 2020 was uh, something for you where uh, if we go back a year or so, you were keynoting around Australia, you're doing a lot of innovation conferences and a lot of talking about a lot of future stuff and things like this. And, and um, none of the futurists technically saw this pandemic coming, but uh, so even the futurists had to sort of pivot for the future. And so what was going through your mind initially once you realized what was happening around the world and and the way you saw it from a business perspective and where were you sort of in your life at that stage? And I'll lead it in, in with a couple of questions and then we'll jump into to what you've got to share, which will be fantastic. Yeah, that's a great question. So um, it's really interesting because a lot of my work was really about, and well, still is about um, connecting people and how technology fits into that. And so it was really interesting to see that shift of going completely online for a lot of things. and how that simultaneously connected us and disconnected us. And so that's really a lot of what I was thinking. And I also realized, um, and part of the reason I shifted to doing this pivot, I would kind of unexpected and really amazing pivot that it's kind of led me to, was that I doing keynote work and, and workshop work, I didn't want to do that online. I realized how important that in-person connection was for groups. It's okay, I think one-on-one, -on -one, but I don't want to be spending a lot of time in this on in front of the screen. And so it was figuring out a way um, for me to be reconnected and figuring out a way to help other people reconnect in this very kind of, I think, almost um, divided time where it's, yeah, we're so connected, but also so not connected. So, so take us back to your first connection with Lego and and when you realize that that was a really um, viable and valuable sort of technology in the space for adults. Yeah, so I, um, in doing my work with using games and play in, in the corporate space, I found that it was, there's a lot of hurdles around people not taking it seriously. And I had been curious about the Lego serious play methodology for quite a while. And magically, I guess kind of ironically as well, um, um, Instagram served me, the algorithm worked really well and served me this picture of someone who had done, just done their Lego Serious Play certification in Perth, didn't know who he was. And I just got in touch with him and said, can you, you know, I'd love to have a coffee with you. And he gave me a demo of how it worked. And it was just that, I think 40 minutes I spent with him seeing the power of this methodology to really um, disarm fear and connect people and unlock insights and it's just this it, it, it really was clear to me that this was a way to help people harness the power of playing curiosity without getting stuck in that kind of negative idea around games and because it had the backing of lego and was used by all these big brands around the world it just was like i need to do this because it's going to be this entry point to working with me and then it's just become kind of the focus of my work because it's um it does all of the things that uh um I'm passionate about and I think are important in the world, but also it's an open source source methodology, which means that you're allowed to innovate on it. You're allowed, they encourage you to, to take it and run with it. And so I could take it and, and um, turn it into something 
that is kind of has my flavor to it. So it just was this kind of magical thing that um, wasn't intended to happen, but did. And I find, you know, if you follow, follow your curiosity and playfulness, magical things happen. Absolutely. And it's interesting because, you know, we've got a, a couple of people on the call already. I don't know more will be listening in later on where networking is very important to them in their business. And, you know, the traditional BNI model of networking, I think, you know, it's sort of, sort of the goose is cooked on that one in many respects. So um, Lego and doing other things that are really gamifying things like networking that I think is coming into its fore. And I know that's something that you've been um, focusing on as well, but let's go, let's ship right <laughs> now into, into the, the guts of, of what we want to talk about today. And that is your own personal pivot for 2020. Uh, yeah. the idea that you came up with and how you've rolled that out and everything like that. So I'm just going to throw the ball to you to, to take this any way you want to. And then cool. when you want me sort of back in, just uh, grab me and bring me back in. Sure. So uh, let's, let's go into Loveco. So I've prepared some, a little slide deck because I, I uh, love to kind of document my research process and journey. So um, I'm going to take you on a bit of an adventure. Um, and let me just share my screen. Zoom has to make it easier for us to share our screens because there's always this sort of like dead space, like they say, this dead space on radio, but the uh, dead space on Zoom calls. Can you guys see that? Everybody's that sharing working? my screen. Yeah, actually, they said, yeah, it's perfect, Kate. They said, and then I'll, awesome. I'll be quiet and let, throw it over to you. By the way, I love this background. They said that Thank one you. of the most asked questions, the most Googled question in uh, 2015 is what what is love? But So go back five oh. years ago. That's what we were Googling. Um, the most <laughs> Google question of 2020 is how to share my screen, screen on Zoom. <laughs> Hashtag priorities, huh? <laughs> exactly. Over to you. Cool. So, um, yeah, it's really, I, I'm feeling pretty excited and a little bit nervous uh, to be sharing this, this with you guys because this is the first time I've talked publicly about this. So it, I'm in early access. Um, but it's, yeah, it's, a, it's an honor to be sharing this with the Circle of Excellence um, community. So I'm just going to tell you a bit about my journey, and, and Mike, you very kindly um, talked a bit about that. So um, I started out my career as kind of a hardcore academic researcher looking at the internet. And so this is the early 2000s, and if we can remember back then, the internet was quite a different place. When I was doing my, um, my, my first research, it was Facebook and YouTube didn't exist and Instagram didn't exist. So a very different place and social media was called Web 2.0, if anybody remembers that. And I was really fascinated by the collision of humans and technology and relationships. So I did look a bit at online dating, but it was more kind of, again, what we now call social media. And um, I was looking at things like internet memes, which were very strange at the time, just like 2003. Uh, now it's just kind of part of how we communicate. And internet friendship. Um, so I wrote the first paper on that in 2005, which is when Facebook was one year old. So Facebook is 15 now. And so these things are very strange. People didn't really understand what I was doing, but it was something that I was really passionate and curious about. And I think runs through my work. Um, and I ended up coming to Australia to do a PhD on Facebook. And a lot of that was actually looking at a lot of the kind of issues when we socialize on an online platform with, with algorithms and privacy issues. And while I was doing all of this kind of serious academic stuff, I started doing game design as a way to keep myself sane and creative and engaged. And so that become, became actually really core to my work. And I finished my PhD and I did a TEDx Perth talk about the importance of games. And I started doing a lot of work uh, around um, the future of work and the future of immersive technology and how play and curiosity are kind of the 21st century superpower. So I did a lot of stuff in the VR space, flew around the country um, and the world, working with major financial institutions and universities and governments at all levels. And I loved um, getting, you know, serious business people out playing and experiencing all of these ways of um, boosting creativity, innovation and teamwork through actual playing games and experiencing what that was like. And as Mike very kindly talked about, one of my favorite tools in doing that is Lego Serious Play. So um, it's a method that's really big in Europe and is starting to really take off in Australia. 
Um, but it was invented by, by Lego and is used by massive global brands around the world to boost innovation and um, as a strategy tool, all of the kind of like, you know, standard business applications. And it's very different than how, if you've grown up playing with Lego or you still play with Lego today, you're not building cars and buildings and houses and castles and spaceships. You're building metaphor and story and emotion in 3D. And so this is what um, a Lego serious play model looks like. It looks very different. It's like a surreal landscape. It's very kind of almost like um, accessing the unconscious mind. And so it's allowing in doing this is you get kind of access to um, things you didn't know you were thinking and access to other people's um, kind of surprises. And as well as doing that, it's actually really good at connecting people and creating understanding with people. And when I was doing this work with in the corporate space, um, sometimes people would say, oh, it feels like we've just had therapy. And they'd notice how for the whole time that they were doing the session, they weren't looking at their phones. And so the more that I did this work, I started finding that people, it was hard to explain. So I wish I could give everybody a, a demo of it now, but it's hard to explain really the power of it unless you've actually done it. So I started carrying around a little Lego kit with me in my, in my bag. So when I'd have a client meeting, I'd just pop it out in the, the cafe and just and give them a quick demo so they, they could get a sense of what it, what it was all about. And I started carrying this bag around with me everywhere. And I mean everywhere. So this is actually in Bali uh, with a, this amazing guy who um, was involved in the, a co-working space called Hubud. Um, and he absolutely loved it. And I just found that it had this magic power um, not just for showing my clients the power of, of Lego for innovation and creativity, but also it would just really build a rapport between me um, and the person and just really like accelerate that connection in a way that I thought was just, it was really, really magical. So at the same time, I was also single. <laughs> so spoiler, um, it, it works because <laughs> I'm not single anymore. Um, but I was using dating apps because that's how you date now. And um, I found that dating was really different than how it was when I was previously single. It wasn't how I remember dating. And I was going on a lot of first dates and I was getting um, a bit jaded and frustrated and not enjoying something that I think probably should be fun. It was just becoming this like really tedious thing. So I had my Lego kit with me um, and I decided that I would just whip it out one day and just start using it on a date. So this is actually um, from second time I ever used it in real life. So this is a real life <laughs> photo. Um, and I would find that it did the same things that it did with, with my corporate clients. It would create a real connection. It would help us to get to the important stuff of the date. It felt like I was having a real like human connection with someone rather than just kind of this tedious, um, you know, uh, I guess, yeah, just being jaded about the state of dating. So I felt that it, it really, it made dating fun again for me. And I had all of these people, when I would tell them about it, they were just like, this is the coolest thing. You need to turn this into a thing. And I kept saying, this is, um, this, you know, I need to focus on my corporate work. This is a distraction. This is just a thing for me to kind of, you know, keep myself sane and entertained and, you know, find my amazing guy. And then of course, coronavirus happened. <laughs> So I couldn't do all my, my fun workshops and keynotes in person anymore. And I just kind of felt like, okay, maybe the universe is trying to tell me something. And um, the fellow who did my Lego Serious Play certification, Michael Fern, who is amazing if you're thinking of doing, um, of getting certified as a facilitator in this, he is absolutely amazing. He's based in Melbourne, but he was super generous and just um, kept encouraging me and was very, very kind and um, yeah, helping me to kind of get it off the ground. So I, I was like, okay, I need to investigate this and see if the problem that I'm having and that it's solving for me, other women are having. Because the other thing I noticed too is that um, as a professional woman, as you know, kind of like a bit more like badass and um, uh, you know, I guess creative and a bit, I guess you know, a little bit different. Um, and into things like Lego and games, I found that a lot of the stuff for single women was really wasn't for me. It was a lot of like soft pink and flowers, which is fine. But again, it wasn't just for me. And so I felt like, okay, there, there's maybe something here. There's other women like me um, that are single and want something different. 
And so I started uh, doing research, you know, coming, going back to my research background and investigating this further. And what I discovered was that dating is actually broken, not just for me, but I think for everybody, but um, especially for, for professional single women, or at least that's what, you know, I understand that because I've lived that experience. And so why is it broken? Well, if you're looking for um, something serious, you know, like a high quality relationship with someone, there's a lot of like nonsense on dating apps, um, a lot of inappropriate things, a lot of stuff that you're just not interested in. And the women that I spoke to were saying things like dating apps are like fast food or e-commerce for men. And there's just a lot of nonsense that happens, right? You spend a lot of time talking to someone and then they just disappear. And there's just a lot of like time wasting. And if you're, you know, professional woman trying to save the world, you will have time for this. Um, so I ended up talking to dozens of professional women around the world uh, from as early as, or young as late twenties to late forties. And these are, this is the, the, the language that came up again and again about their dating experience. So that, you know, they wanted, they had amazing lives. They wanted someone to share it with, um, but they weren't willing to settle. And this is kind of like what the dating experience was like. It just wasn't fun. It was the same thing I was experiencing. And they described it as the dating, the, the fire hose of dating apps. So you just like turn it on and you get all these messages and a lot of them are just nonsense. So, so how do you deal with this? And they wanted something, you know, that helps to create a connection more quickly that wasn't drinking, because I think we use drinking as like a way to do that. But, you know, it works temporarily, but then maybe the next day it's not so great. Um, so, you know, well, how, can, how can we connect with someone more authentically and quickly without getting drunk? Um, and so I asked women what, you know, what they did to solve this problem, the fact that dating was broken for them. And they said they would delete the app which is something I did multiple times because I just get so frustrated. And then it leads to this, which is you're kind of like, you're damned if you do, you're damned if you don't. And why this happens, I think there's a number of factors, but I think a num like one of the key factors is, and if you've seen the social dilemma, and this kind of connects back to my early work on um, looking at Facebook and algorithms and, and connecting online, is that the way that social media works is that it's all about, um, keeping us engaged, but not really connected with each other. So keeping us swiping or um, scrolling or clicking. Um, but, you know, if we find people love, then they get off the dating app and then they're not doing that anymore. So that's kind of why we're in that situation. And then, of course, coronavirus, we're feeling very disconnected with each other for so many different reasons. So my research clearly showed me um, that there was, there was a need for this. It wasn't just me that was having this problem and um, this solution would be really great for other, for other women like me. So I started developing it further and researching it and um, I created a purpose-built solution um, that I felt addressed all of these, these problems that women were sharing with me. So adding in some strategy that I'd used in dating. So really kind of taking um, the Lego serious play basis, but really making it my own and really turning into a purpose-based solution. Um, and I think this is some feedback um, from someone who's had the love go experience, which I think really explains what the power of it is, which is that it makes dating fun and romantic and you can get to the sticky questions around like, do you want kids or, you know, um, where do you want to be in five years? And those are questions that I've actually um, explored with Lego on a date. Well, it's still being fun and romantic and not being awkward and feeling like an interview. And the fact I also found an amazing guy um, from using Lego, from using Love Go, I think was like a sign to me that this Love Go thing was a thing from the universe. So I really should take it forward. So how does this all work and why does it work? So in doing this kind of investigation around turning this into a thing and taking it out into the world, I started um, looking at the, the research I'd already done um, for my corporate work around curiosity and play. So there's a huge body of research in psychology and early childhood development and game studies and the existing play, uh, research on play and curiosity um, around Lego serious play. And so looking at how curiosity and play are really, really powerful tools for bringing people together. 
So what if it comes from early childhood development? Because we still have a stigma about um, researching adult spying, but I think it's definitely transferable. Um, so Karen Purvis is a renowned early childhood psychologist in the States, and she looks at how um, play is fundamental for forming trust-based relationships because it disarms fear, which I think is, you know, a directly applicable to what happens on dates. And so there's this concept that I used in my corporate work called the magic circle, which is kind of, a, if you're, if anybody here on the call is a game studies person, I've kind of appropriated the term. I'm going to assume most of you um, haven't heard of the magic circle. So I've kind of reused it for my own purposes, but it's this idea basically of when you're playing a game or when you are playing with Lego, you're in this magic circle. So this magic bag of Lego creates the circle and you're allowed to feel safe and be curious and be vulnerable and to connect with people in a way that doesn't usually happen outside of the magic circle. So I love this example from my corporate work. So this is with some serious academics at Deakin. Um, the guy in the purple shirt is uh, actually most of my PhD supervisor. So some you know very senior academics. And so I was doing a workshop with them around play and immersive reality. And again, I like to get very hands-on. So I love to give people ex hands-on experiences of games and game design. So part of this exercise was we went outside to the courtyard and we were playing a game where part of it involved going from one side of the courtyard to the other, pretending to be a helicopter. So this is in front of all of the other academics and the students. And I said, okay, you have to pretend to be a helicopter as part of this game. And so this is what happened. And so I love that because if I just said, you know, if we weren't in the magic circle, if we weren't playing a game, go and pretend to be a helicopter, people just wouldn't do that. But because it's in the game space in the magic circle, it allows for people to do something that might seem weird or vulnerable or scary otherwise. So that's the really the power behind why Love Go works. So I spent more than a, a year probably researching and developing this. And so I present to you <laughs> Love Go, which is a revolutionary dating method for badass professional women. So the core of it is this um, custom made Lego bag, um, the magic bag that you bring on dates. And it comes with uh, special customized cards that I designed that have little prompts that you can use on the date. Uh, and those are actually based on, on, on the research as well around how to generate interpersonal closeness. But in addition to that, there's, uh, strategy around that I integrated into the method as well. So how do you decide who to go on a date with? Um, how do you, how you more kind of strategic about your time? Um, and it's also applicable to um, networking in a professional context. Um, the other thing that I thought was really important is that I also noticed that a lot of dating approaches, especially for men, are very focused on the other person, but not on your own personal development. So part of my own um, journey with this was actually doing a lot of work on myself. And I found that Lego and using Lego on dates was actually really helpful for me to kind of get clear on what it was that I wanted and unlock kind of the thinking in, in my own brain about that. So in part of the Love Go method, before you actually go on these dates with your magic bag, is we use the Lego I work with clients to find out what it is that they actually want. What kind of relationship do they want? What kind of person do they want to be with? And what kind of person do they want to be? And what might be holding them back from that? So what it allows for is it allows dating and this whole journey to become a tool for personal growth, growth and learning. It's not just about finding a guy. Um, and so even if you're going on dates and maybe that person isn't for you, you've learn something more about yourself and they've learned something more about their self. So that's another bit of feedback that I got was that it, it gave insight and it helps people to, to grow personally. So it, it, it means that that journey is there's something to be gained from it, even if it's not the guy for you. So how do you join the love go revolution? So as I mentioned, it's an early access. So it's, I'm offering limited foundation memberships to work with me. So um, it's a limited time, exclusive opportunity to work with me. Uh, you get the kit and the cards and how to use it and one-on-one -on -one strategy sessions with me. 
another bit of feedback I got from the women I spoke to was that it, it's a very lonely process and I felt that as well. And so I'm developing a networking community um, so you get access to that too when it launches. And I'm also going to be doing premium content for single professional women that isn't necessarily focused entirely on dating, because I think that there's a need for that as well. And so if you or someone you know is curious about this, I'm also offering a limited number of complimentary love readiness assessments um, to find out more about where you're at and if this might be right for you. So I want to leave it there, but before I do, I would like to call you to imagine so in all we've learned today, imagine if we're able to start authentically connecting with each other again, healing divides and creating deeper understanding. Imagine if we were able to be curious about each other again and to be playful and excited about the journey to find our special someone wherever it takes us and have loads of fun along the way. Thank you. So you can right, get in touch. <laughs> right. there's the, so there's questions. The email. Yeah, yeah well, we've got it. I've got, I've been making a lot of notes here because oh, I excellent. Think, you know, some some people watching this will go, oh, you know, I'm in a relationship. I've been married for 40 years or whatever. So, you know, why do I need a dating app? But I mean, there's so much stuff in what you've said that's so transferable in so many ways. I'm going to mm. ask uh, Sahaja had to 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 go for a meeting, and she um, she wanted to ask you a question. I have to leave soon. Uh, but I'd like to know about the magic circle process. Can you sort of explain that a little bit more? Yeah, so the magic circle is, I think the best way to describe it is just think about any time that you've played a game. Uh, and it's almost like something that we forget. And I think when we were kids in the schoolyard, we would just be in the magic circle all the time. So it's this space and it's like a mindset where we are free to explore and to fail because it doesn't feel like failure. It just feels like playing, you know, so we'll play a game and we'll change the rules and see what happens. And so it's taking that almost like this space and using it for other things. So we using it in the corporate world and then now using it on dates. And so it's this way to be in this space where magic can happen. Um, because it's like a safe, a safe space where playfulness allows for all of these things to happen that wouldn't otherwise happen. And so I could actually feel that when I was using this um, Lego on dates where it'd be normally I'd be like, oh, this isn't my guy and I just want to leave. But otherwise, <laughs> I would use the Lego and it was like, okay, maybe he's not my guy, but I feel like I've had an authentic connection. He's learned more about himself. I've learned more about myself and we've had, you know, had a, a meaningful human connection and had fun. <laughs> Very cool. Um, so just a couple of things. So Philippe said he's got definitely got a couple of female friends that may need this. Also, nice. Kate, you've got, uh, <laughs> you've got Melanie on the call. She's a Circle of Excellence member from Dur Durban and she's waving. And um, she, uh, she works with women that have come out of um, really abusive relationships, need mm. to be secured, need to rebuild their whole life. And of course, some of the things that we've been talking about together is how do you build, build trust? Because just because you came out of an abusive relationship doesn't mean you can't enter into a loving relationship at some stage in the future. So there's some, some definite things between you and her that could be discussed offline. I wanted to go back to, to my notes and then I'm gonna flick you a few questions. So um, one of the things, these are in no particular order, by the way, because I've written them on this coaster here. Um, <laughs> that just happened to be next to me at the time rather than my journal, which was just slightly out of my reach. So one of the things here was the whole concept of play. Now, this is something you've been passionate about, you know, in the years that I've known you. And um, it's something that most people totally undervalue in their lives. Yeah. Yet when you had that slide up about, you know, play in the role of early childhood development, et cetera, et cetera, I was looking at that slide thinking it's not only about early childhood development. So many people just need to play more. And, you know, even this, I want to go to your whole idea because that's what I want to talk about separately. But I first wanted to throw this up. What's your view of how people can play more in their lives and in business with their customers, with their suppliers, with their strategic alliances? and with their families? 
Yeah, and I think that is to it, play is definitely undervalued, and that was a challenge I had in my work was it, and I think it's actually shifted now because I think we are you know a lot of the 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 Zoom activities that people are engaging in are just like how do we have fun together again? So I think we're we're one of the silver linings, I guess, of coronavirus, if we can say that it has silver linings, is that we are seeing the value of play and fun again. And there's a really great researcher named uh, Dr. Gordon Neufeld, who I actually had the um, honor of interviewing on my podcast. Um, but he actually talks about, he talks about, um, he does early childhood psychology as well, but connects it to adults and talks about the, um, similar to the magic circle, but he talks about play as an emotional playground. So as the space where you can, your emotions can kind of work themselves out. And so it's really important. He talks about how his wife and him will um, build puzzles or do other playful activities just to reconnect with each other. And so he talks about it almost like a practice that is like exercise or meditation, having playfulness that you spend your time um, engaging in. So for him, play has to have, it can't be outcome-based. So it has to yeah. be just for its own sake. So he'll talk about like playing music or painting or puzzles. Um, Lego, I think you can do it if you're not really building it with instructions. If you're doing more of a free play style Lego, like the Lego series play can be more like that. Um, I also find things like rock climbing and bouldering, which is, there's not a lot of playgrounds for adults, but I'm really into bouldering, which is like puzzles for your body. So it's basically you're climbing these crazy puzzles that people have created in a climbing gym. And I find that's a really great way to play. So um, there's lots of opportunities, but I think it's really underdeveloped, but we're starting to learn how to play more again with each other. But I think it's that component of, um, it has to be without a specific outcome other than just being for itself. Yep. Now we've got some questions coming in, but I'll, I'll just leave them for a second. I just want to go back to the business side of this for a minute, because um, this to me and the notes I wrote down here is you did a year's research on this. Whereas yep. most entrepreneurs do a day's <laughs> research before they launch their business if they're lucky. Most entrepreneurs sit in their lounge room and go, oh, what can I do to make some money? Oh, um, gee, there's a beach outside of me. I can sell ice creams on the beach. And then they'll run and buy an ice cream van and go to the beach. And they'll go, why isn't anybody buying ice cream? And then they'll go, oh, it's the middle of winter and it's four degrees, right? So yeah. but you literally did a year's research. So I, I'm interested in your process of research because you're very academic in your process. I mean, the first mm. person that I've ever heard of a write a thesis on Facebook, <laughs> I'm sure a lot of people came after you and copied you, but, um, but you know, you got, she's got a doctorate of Facebook folks, technically. <laughs> so um, I'm really interested in your research process because I think this is really helpful for entrepreneurs. Yeah, and so I think that's where my um, academic background was really helpful was that kind of rigor around spending a year doing it, um, but also, the approach that I used in my, my PhD was ethnography, which um, does appear in the corporate world as user ethnography. So it's basically this idea of watching what people do. And so my PhD actually started out with a, as a, with a broad look at social media, which is actually then called the social web or web 2.0. And so the focus on Facebook was just me being curious and following what users were doing. So. I looked at a whole bunch of different platforms and then was saying, oh, it's actually this Facebook thing that they're talking about. So I'm gonna focus on that. And what are they talking about? It's privacy, that's the core issue. So it's just being really aware of what people are talking about and being curious and being open and to where that might take you and being open to the unexpected. Because I think part of the re reason it, I spent a year researching this was at the beginning, I wasn't actually intending to do anything with it. It was just for my own kind of fixing my own problem in my own kind of academically nerdy way. <laughs> so um, it's very much around, yeah, that being curious, paying attention, listening, and being open to where things will take you. Yeah, very good. And uh, the other thing is there's a, a real focus in Love Go on disruption. So you've picked an industry that's fundamentally, um, in fact, all the same. Right, because yeah. you know, um, 
it's really become the world of dating apps like Tinder and goodness knows whatever else. And you've gone, this just doesn't work, right? And you've experienced it yourself and you've talked to others who've experienced and, you know, you've talked to a lot of women and I would have no idea because I've never used it, but, but uh, I could only imagine what men think too, you know, because they're, what, what the hell yeah, do they do whole, to even get noticed? That's a whole other, a whole other exactly. thing. <laughs> So you've <laughs> taken that product. and you've gone, you've, you've actually done one of the things that, you know, we, Lundy and I love to say, which is you have to go online to take people offline, right? Yeah. So it's like you go into an online space and then you grab them, you take them offline, which is the basis of dating, of course, in the first place. But then you gamify that process so it takes the, um, the scorpion tail out of it. So it's like yeah. um, it's like when you it's like when you go uh, and teach a new salesperson sales. They they're only worried about whether they sold or not. But for the most part, it's just a training exercise to see how better you become. So um, what do you think? And then I'll get on to. I think uh, uh, Kristen's asked a great question, so I'll get on to that next. But what do you think, Kate, is the process? of seeing potential to disrupt an industry? Did, is there a process or is it just observation? Oh, that is a really good question. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's, again, it's going back to that, that curiosity and really paying attention to what people are saying. And I think if, it, if it's something, I think the key for me has also been finding some, finding a problem that I have myself. I think that's a really important piece in really making a difference and finding that thing that can be disruptive. Because if you have that problem yourself, then you really, really understand it. So that's why this is specifically for professional women, because that's what I understand. And when I was doing my market research, I initially thought I'll do it for men. But in talking to men, men have a completely different problem with online dating, which is that they don't, there's no, they don't get messages from anybody. So women are getting fire hosed and men are getting no messages and everybody's just misunderstanding each other. But um, yeah, so if you can find something that you personally have, I think that's where you can find, okay, how can I disrupt this? Because if I'm having that problem and then you can find other people who are having that problem, there's clearly an opportunity there, which is exactly what happened with LoveGo. Um, and with Facebook, I actually was a user of Facebook at the time and the specific approach I used was an auto ethnography, which is actually involving yourself in the process. So it's this acknowledgement that we can't be objective. So we're just gonna acknowledge that you're part of the research and you're, there's a subjectivity to it. And so me being part of that and exploring those issues around what does this mean for how I interact with people meant that I had a more personal understanding of the problem that was being created by Facebook. Um, so I, my PhD came out in 2012 and that was six years before Cambridge Analytica happened. And I remember at the time, the university tried to get some coverage of my PhD and no one cared. And then six years later, the BBC was calling, wanting to get right. comment on Cambridge Analytica. So it's like from that, if you, if you have something personal, you're open and curious about what other people are doing, asking questions, you can have that really tremendous insight that you know, can help you to understand a, where a big problem. Maybe too soon, that's the problem I've had is, is the timing has been wrong, it's been too soon. <laughs> so maybe sticking with it is, uh, and timing is another piece in there and, and, and finding that just thing that you can disrupt. Uh, timing, timing is definitely uh, definitely everything Let's as, as well. Let's go to, to the question here and then I'll come back with a couple of other things. Um, Kristen's asked, does the LoveGo methodology also cover how to interact with people on dating apps? Like what yes. to include on your profile, how to assess if you want to meet in person, the level of trust required before you're going on a date, specifically after lockdown mentality has been embedded. She lives in Melbourne. The trust required is higher due to fear of infection. Um, how, to, how to overcome all of that? Did you yes. understand yeah, the question? Yes, and it definitely does include, and that I would say is almost as important as bringing the Lego on the date is having... Um, what I think uh, the women I talked to would describe as a filter. So a filter for who you go out with. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll give you a bit of, uh, um, yeah. So the, one of the key filters is actually if, if someone can organize a proper date with you and that actually filters out 95% of guys. 
Um, Cause it's kind of like letting people, I think people show you how they're going to treat you so they can say one thing, but their actions say another. So if you create that space for a guy to ask you out on a date, a proper date at a nice place that shows that they're serious. Um, and another thing you can do that I um, did that helps because a lot of the, the stuff I've seen for women don't, doesn't actually talk about the safety aspect of this. So I actually had a yep. second phone that I would use um, to, uh, so I could give out my number a bit more privately and had a bunch of things that I would do to keep myself safe. But one of them is having a second phone, um, not using, people could Google me and because of Google and because of Perth being a small town, you could easily find me with my first name and my, my, my occupation as a game designer. So using just your first initial, if you can, there's all sorts of other things that you can do around um, being safe. And you can also do before you go out, um, use, uh, a, do a Lego date with someone. So if they have Lego or they can borrow Lego from someone, you can do that before you go out with them or a video call is another way of kind of, if you're not feeling super safe, but yeah, safety is very important, especially with all this stuff with COVID. Absolutely. Um, Philippe's put here, Zeitgeist. Good movie, by the way, go and watch it on YouTube. Um, the defining spirit or mood of a particular period of history as shown by the ideas and beliefs of the time. Zeitgeist equals perfect time to market in a nutshell. So I think, uh, I think that's true too. And I do say good movie because it, it actually was a very, very good movie. It's, it's a documentary, in fact. Um, now, Melanie says, this sounds great when you've already connected with somebody to go on a date. How do you find that person to start the conversation with if you're not using a dating app? How do you, oh, that's a good question. Um, I have to say most of my experience was on uh, dating apps, but I also had people asking me out on LinkedIn, <laughs> which I'm not sure if it was good or bad. I haven't decided on that yet. I mean, it's good because LinkedIn um, is a bit of a more professional space, but you're not really meant to be using it as a dating app. But I think um, part of it is just being, I think, available and open. So um, going to places where you would like to uh, meet someone. So the, the rock climbing gym was kind of a place I was hoping to meet a guy. It didn't really work out. Um, yeah, I, I have to say my solution is really focused on dating apps because that's really where most people talk to each other. But I, that's a good question for me to think about a bit further. And I think the answer there uh, in, not the answer, but a part answer, Melanie, is, you know, networking groups. So, for mm. instance, you know, this is something that in, you know, uh, Kate, in, in female networking groups, you know, like there's the Athena group in Asia, there's Extraordinary Women in South Africa, there's Her Business in New Zealand, um, and those type of things, those, those type of networking groups, which are really well patroned as well. I mean, the Athena group in Singapore alone has got over a thousand members. So, um, you know, that's something whereby, uh, you know, to, to actually use that and, and a good alternative for you is to go in and do a presentation in those sort of things as well. We'll start to get people using that and then take that into ordinary networking. Let me, let me fire back uh, to some of my questions here. I noticed here um, there was a focus. You had one slide there, um, which basically you had on there a whole range of words that was feedback from women on their experiences on dating. And it reminded me of how you built this and attended to fixing the problems that sit in key words. And one of the things, as you know, Kate, because we've done this with you, um, is to sort of bring your business down to three key words. So for instance, in our business, it's prosperity, freedom, and purpose. That's all we do is we help people become more prosperous, more free, and with purpose. So I love the fact that um, what you've done, even in something that's fun, and it's so easy to be liked with this, and I want to get to my next point soon, that you've actually built this on such solid footprints here of the problems that people are facing. So what you've got here actually addresses those problems and those problems are key words. Um, and then what I looked at here as I li was listening to you talk is I saw um, that there's a massive story behind the story here. And the story is, you know, here's this great new product, it's disrupting an industry, et cetera, et cetera. 
but it was actually built to fix a problem that you had yourself. Just yeah. like um, Ann Tam, who's one of our great clients and one of the covers on Lead Magazine, who now has been named by Cambridge University as one of the top 50 educators in the world seven years in a row. The, her reason for doing this is she couldn't actually find a school she wanted to put her daughters in. Yeah. Her daughters are now in their 30s. But when they were kids, she couldn't find a school she wanted to put them in, so she started one. And I think so much of this disruption is driven by what we're facing ourselves. The, the founders of Airbnb you know, couldn't afford a hotel, so they, they decided on Airbnb. Now, it's really interesting. Their pivot during COVID, if you've seen it or if anybody's seen it, is they're now going into Airbnb real estate. So basically, if you've got something set up to be Airbnb, you can actually sell it through Airbnb real estate. So they're becoming a real estate agency now online as well. So this business that you have, as with all of ours, has certain layers and things like that. And if you look at the picture behind me, folks, you know, the wildebeest, this picture is actually called, it's called the crossing, right? We find it fun that the wildebeest always jumps over me, but but this this is the crossing that we're going through at the moment at the end of this year, moving into next year is crossing over from what we may have been doing and the ideas that we may have done, tapping into the research and moving into these things. Kate, I'm interested in, you've got a process that you use that went from feedback to trials and into focus groups. Tell me more about how you refined the product and the service before you got to the point where you are literally prepared to come on calls like this and talk about it because it's so different than anything you've done before. What was that process that gave you that confidence in, in your product or your service? Yeah, so I actually um, drew on my, my um, work as a game designer because the game design process um, is very similar to the kind of like startup and lean method around you create a minimum viable product and then you test it and you iterate it. So in game design, you create uh, a prototype and you get play testers out playing the game and then you watch them and see what happens because you know when people play a game, things are going to happen that are very unexpected. Um, then if you just don't do anything with it, it's, it's the intersection of games and people are very, very surprising. And that's the fun of it. So it was very much doing that um, and testing various different pieces of it and getting feedback from people um, on the different components to it uh, and then triangulating that with the research. So the existing research that I had already done um, and then just, yeah, so the, the main thing was testing the, the kit and the cards. And so the, the card idea actually came, and there's just a lot of talking to people about it, um, just getting data from as many points as I could. Um, the idea for the cards that, that, so that the standard Lego kit doesn't come with cards. So that, that idea came from, from Michael Fern, who was my Lego Serious Play trainer. Um, and that allows for um, when you're on the date to, instead of being like, I'm interrogating you, you give the cards to your date. So they feel like, you know, they're, they're actually, you know, and they have, um, they have control over what's happening because they get to pick what you're going to build. Um, and so that kind of just came out of it doing and saying, okay, I want to be facilitating on a date because that's kind of what was happening. So how do I let the date be the facilitator? And then what was on the cards was based on this other research paper that I'd read on generating interpersonal closeness. So it was um, sometimes called the 36 questions that will have you fall in love. Um, and so in the appendix of this research paper, they have the 36 questions. And so I actually tested that accidentally. I was like, oh, this would be fun to take on a date. Um, and it worked really, really well. So then later on, I came back to it and said, oh, that paper, those questions from that paper would be really good basis for the, um, for the, the cards. So it was just a lot of um, experimentation and again, like being open and being curious and iterating. Um, so I would say it was, it was a bit easier when I wasn't trying to uh, make something with Love Go because I, I started noticing that as soon as I was like in my research mode with guys, it didn't, it stopped working. So um, yeah, it's, it's that being playful and curious and just, not, I think, expecting an outcome is important. Yeah, fantastic. And I, I think what, what sits with me through all of this is your deep-seated research, your ability to um, not bring something out that's 
you know, half cooked, but also not to wait until it's perfect in because so many entrepreneurs have got to get it perfect before they can actually bring something out. So this is really allowing people to play with it. I mean, I'm an author and, and I have beta readers. So beta readers are the people, for those of you that don't know, that you release your book to and they read it and they give you feedback. But feedback in itself is irrelevant. It's more the feedback of direct questions that that, that person's looking after, like, did the plot make sense? Did you feel bored at any part of the book, you know, rather than just saying, well, I didn't like Joe, the character or such and such and, you know, or, or any of that, because maybe you weren't meant to like Joe, um, which is another interesting thing when it comes to love go. And I'm going to start to bring this to, uh, to, to a close very soon. But the other interesting thing is to me, Kate, this is very much a polarity um, strategy. So, Meaning, and, you know, we're all for polarity. We're all for, you know, um, all the people who like this go over here and all the people who like that go over here, right? Whereas what most human beings try and do, they're pleasers. They try and please everybody. That's, you know, if you're sitting there and right now you're listening to this call and you've got clients that you wish you didn't have next year, you're a pleaser, right? So get real with it, you know? So you have to become more of a polarizing in your view so i'm sure when you started doing this and bringing out lego kits at a few dates some guys were like oh man yeah okay right i'll just go i've got to go to the toilet you know something just came up taxi etc yeah. etc and then other people just went wow and just fully embraced this so that was probably a bit of a criteria for you in the way in which you like to live your life of of how engaged people would be rather than saying, come on, honey, we just met, let's go skydiving, which um, might be a little <laughs> more polarizing. Yeah, and I have actually thought about that, about that a lot. I remember you, um, in Bali when you guys were talking about that, um, you know, that idea of, of being, you want people to feel a strong emotion. Like you don't want to offend anybody, but you want people to either, you know, love it or leave it, I think. And yeah. so I've thought about that a lot in my marketing too, because it's been... Um, you know, it's, it's interesting putting this stuff on LinkedIn because there's, you know, people saying, oh, this is stuff for Facebook. This is LinkedIn. This is a professional site. So it has been really embracing that, that idea um, from you guys. So I really appreciate that because it's like, just thinking back to that and it helps me to be a bit more brave in the things I put on LinkedIn. Um, but yeah, on dates, I think it's, I would find actually the guys who uh, were turned off when I invited them to play Lego with me, um, that was like a sign that they weren't my guy because you know how are you doing dating me if you're not into playing but there's also research that backs that up um some of that early childhood psychology looks at um there's a connection between lack of play in childhood and becoming a a, a violent criminal when you <laughs> grow up not to say that you know that's going to happen for sure but you know i think there is a sign if you're a, a play adverse there might that might be a bit of a red flag so that's another good filter um there for you know who you want to date <laughs> Fantastic really piece play. of advice, actually. Really, <laughs> really good. You know, for, for anybody on the call who is single or watching this uh, later yeah. on the recording who's single, you know, that's a great question to slip in. Oh, tell us about your childhood. What games did you like? <laughs> I didn't really like to play any games. Okay, I've got to go. You know, so. <laughs> yeah. So that's yeah. great. Folks, do we have any last questions for Kate as we bring this uh, to a sort of close? And Kate, I do have a last question. So I'm going to ask that while, uh, whilst everybody's thinking here. For you as an entrepreneur who has been very successful in a very particular journey, focusing, re focusing really as a futurist with a, um, with a view, with a, a mandate on fun and games, and it's not only the game design stuff, but really gamifying life, from a futuristic point of view, what's this journey taught you as an entrepreneur? What have you learned from this journey? Oh, that's a really great question. So I think in, in the past, I've thought about how um, there is, I mean, we talk about following your passion and following your heart is like advice that you get, but it's not really useful because so it's almost like a Venn diagram. And the first two circles are one, you have to find something you're passionate about. But then two, it has to be actually solving a problem for something or doing something that makes a difference. You can't just follow your passion if it's not 
if there's no market for it, which is sad, but true in the way that, you know, we currently have our society configured. And I think about my dad because he is, uh, his PhD, he did a PhD on, in geology. So he's a rock, a rock nerd. So he's very obsessed with rocks and volcanoes and his PhD was on volcanoes. And when he graduated, there wasn't a lot of work for people who are obsessed with rocks, (laughs) but luckily he met my mom and she said, you should do an MBA. And so he did that and then um, got a job, which he still does as a financial analyst for the mining industry. So he gets to spend his time looking at rocks and going down mines and doing all the things he loves and it's solving a problem for someone. So I think about that as like, how do you, you know, that that Venn diagram. But the third one that I didn't really um, experience or, or, yeah, that didn't really emerge for me until this this journey with Love Go is it there's almost like this, it's, I'm not sure what to describe it, but it's like a magic, there's like a magic third thing. And I've been experiencing that with Love Go where it's where you really hit, um, it's like maybe like what you're really supposed to be doing or your purpose, or there's a third one in there that I've experienced with Love Go that I haven't experienced with any other projects or any other things that I've done where it just really resonates with people in this way that's just easy and magical. Maybe it's the zeitgeist. I'm not sure what it is. Um, but I've just been getting messages from people I haven't spoken to in years saying how much this resonates with them. And so there's almost like this maybe secret ingredient that when you have those three things together, it is, yeah, when you just know. And I, when I was working on this project at the beginning, um, I, I almost gave up a few times. There were a number of people who were just really, really kind and supporting me and encouraging me, but they got me to the point where I could actually see that there was something here that I hadn't experienced elsewhere. And it helped me to be brave and bold and to keep going, even though it, it felt very difficult. And uh, I, it's given me a fearlessness that I have not had with other, with other endeavors. So I'm not sure what that third thing is, but there's something there. Yeah, no, very good. Um, people are starting to wrap up now because we're at two minutes to the hour. Filippo said, thanks for the talk, Kate. Really thankful. Um, he's thankful his parents always wanted him to play outside all of the time. So, you know, Filippo's nice. six foot four and, and you know, he used to knock people out in international rugby. So I <laughs> doubt that they were just saving the cutlery and the glassware and like that. Um, Kate, uh, it's been fantastic. It's, uh, and congratulations on, on what you've been doing. Thank you. This has um, been amazing. Really, really fantastic. And I think we've got a lot out of it on so many different levels here. And uh, I really do appreciate you being on the call as well.